Okay, so we're going to do another workshop now, basically on archaeological recording sheets. Um, there's three or four different types of sheets that we typically use on a site. There's a fill sheet, a cut sheet, a wall sheet and a burial sheet. But certainly for the workshop today, we're going to be looking at the fill and the cut. We may look at, at burials in a different video. Before we even begin, I guess it's, it's worth taking a step back and there's two different basic styles of recording in archaeology. I'm sure some of you will already know this. There's the single context recording or the feature recording system and then it's recording by spit or excavation unit. We don't really have the time to go into the, the different reasons these techniques are used in any great depth today, but it's obviously in, informed by context. And the context would be cultural, it would be geographic in terms of the physical environment. So for argument's sake, if you are digging a Native American site in America or an Aboriginal site in Australia, where there's been a natural accumulation of soil, you'll take it down in arbitrary spits and some images are going to come up on screen to illustrate um, what I'm talking about as we go. And you would map the cultural materials through those spits and radiocarbon date materials from those different spits so you can see peaks and troughs and changes in human occupation through those sediments in time. But those sediments have accumulated naturally over hundreds or thousands of years. When we talk about single context recording or feature recording, we are largely taking um, the recording system adopted by the Museum of London, adapting it. So our sheets that we have here come largely from, from what the Museum of London says with ad adaptations to different countries and also our own adaptations for a teaching field school. But all the single context recording system records things by event. So what we mean by recording by event is you can see a, a recognizable occurrence on a site and you record it by the occurrence rather than arbitrary spit. So if we go in back up to Ferry Garrig, if you've looked at any of our Ferry Garrig videos and if you don't subscribe to our YouTube channel or the YouTube channel of the Irish National Heritage Park and do watch them, we may have a large ditch around the site um, and that's a single event. Digging that ditch was one event and then a load of fill is pushed into that ditch and that's a second event and then they decide we don't want the ditch anymore and they fill it in completely and that's a third event. So that's only three basic events, okay? Um, it gets a little bit problematic sometimes when you go to its basis level. So another good example comes from Ferry Carrig where the site was quarried in the 19th century and they ripped all the stone out of the medieval remains, took what they wanted to build other buildings and threw what they didn't want over their sh shoulder. And of course, all those actions of them discarding that stone, it's thousands upon thousands upon thousands of individual actions. But coming back as archaeologists, we'll just recognize a large rubble deposit and we'll give that one event number. So it isn't a perfect system, no system is ever perfect, but it's much better suited to recording monumental large archaeology. And certainly the excavation unit system would not be suited to the sort of archaeology we're excavating over here in Wexford at the minute. Neither system is superior than the other, they're just different and used for different reasons. So having got all that introduction into place, Let's talk about the sheets we use to record in the single context recording system. And we'll start um, from top to bottom. You'll see this pop up, hopefully on my right hand side, and you can follow as we go. So we'll start with the top um, box of the fill sheet. And you'll see the first thing you're asked to put in is an F number. The F obviously stands for feature, and we tend to give our feature numbers out sequentially in blocks of 100 or 1000 by the area, or by the cutting, or by the trench that we're working in. So if you're working in cutting one, your feature number for argument's sake would be F1001. If you're excavating a distinct burial cut, you know you're not going to get a thousand features, so you probably might just give them out in blocks of hundreds. So your burial cut might be our fill might be F101 and the cut then being F102. So they're just sequential numbers that you give out. The excavation number you see directly below that for our site down here, 17E 0318. Almost every country has some sort of permit system for archaeology. I'll mention the Irish one briefly, just to give you some introduction, but again it's beyond the remit of this video to talk about in any detail. In Ireland, you need to pass a, a state competency exam to hold an archaeological license, and then every time you want to conduct an excavation, you apply for a permit and you're given an individual number, which is what this is here. The state competency exam assesses your ability to um, know where to find sources, where to research, your CV, what are the sites you've excavated, your fines recognition, your knowledge of legislation, your knowledge of how to conserve fines on site, etc, etc. And then every time you apply for an individual permit for a dig, 
you sign a contract with the state that binds you into certain conditions which include publication, putting a summary into an, onto an online resource, preparing a report, etc. So we'll put a link up at the bottom so you can look at this in more detail if you want. But I suppose suffice to say we have a very good legislative system in Ireland for protecting our, our subsurface heritage. The address you'll see here is Newtown, County Wexford, Ireland, and the area or grid is the area you're working in, i.e. cutting one or trench one, trench two, etc. The supervisor is your archaeological supervisor on site. The date started is the date you started excavating or recognizing that feature. And on the day you start that, you should also register the feature in your feature register, which looks something like this, okay? Now again, that'll pop up to my right, but you will see that there's the feature number, a very brief description, the date and the initials. And this is just a running log of how many features have been found in that cutting or that area. So you can keep track of how many sheets you should have and what amount of recording should be done, okay? The excavator is self-explanatory. It's yourself, it's whoever's doing it. And sometimes it is worth checking on a, on a large site that there's not multiple people with the same initials because you're going to put initials in there. So that's the first box, okay? Then we come to description. So I'll take a sip of water just before we go into that. Now, um, your description, you'll see that it asks for feature type. This is over towards the left-hand side. And this is again on the fill sheet. It's asking, is it a deposit? Is it a fill? Is it a surface? Is it a stakeholder? Is it natural? The difference between a deposit and a fill is quite simple. It's whether it's contained in something. So the most simple analogy I can give you is that bottle of water is a fill. Okay, the water within the bottle is a fill. If I was to open up the cap and let that run all over the table, it would become a deposit. Okay, so it's no longer a contained thing. A surface is in fact a type of deposit. So if you think of cobble surfaces, but also road surfaces, concrete, and um, down, to, down to carpets, they're all different types of surfaces um, that are a subcategory of deposit, but they're given their own, their own category there. Stake holes, when you drive a stake into the ground. And then sometimes we describe natural soils. Archaeology is obviously not geology. It's not in the business, or geomorphology. It's not in the business of describing natural soils. But sometimes we do, simply because it could be relevant to how people use the site. If they had denser occupation in certain areas because of different geomorphologies, better agriculture in some areas, reasons why they avoided certain areas of the site for settlement, etc., etc. okay? So you tick which box is, um, which is most apt or most appropriate for yourself, which is probably going to be fill. And then in the description, you're asked to put in five basic points, one, two, three, four, five. With the students, we frequently ask them to list those out to make sure they can't miss any. Shape, is it linear? Um, is it oval? Is it circular, etc., etc. How is it orientated? Is it northeast to southwest, east to west? Obviously, if it's a circle, it'll have no orientation. So just remember that. Color. Um, this is something I could have brought with me today. A lot of you guys have excavated abroad will use the Munsell color chart, which gives a scientific value for color. It's almost like a paint chart for soils and you can hold it over or close to the soils and get a scientific value for the, the soil color. We don't tend to use that over here. We tend just to give a narrative description like mid-brown or brown with a gray hue or whatever it might be, okay? The composition, if we flip, uh, flip this sheet over, I'm sure it'll flip over beside me here as well, you'll see on the back right, um, we bo bottom right-hand corner, we have put a description on how to describe soils in Ireland, okay? It's the specific to Ireland, the UK, um, and come at the, the conclusion of what its composition is. Is it mainly sand? Is it mainly silt? Is it mainly clay, etc.? Most of what we excavate over here tends to be silty clay. And then what is the compaction? Is it um, moderately compact? Is it loose and friable? Is it very compact or is it endurate, which is almost like concrete? It's almost getting, you know, very, 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 very um, compacted. So you put in these five descriptions here, trying to capture the essence of what the feature is, its physical characteristics. A description that, sorry, a mistake I should say that most students make is that they also put the interpretation here. The interpretation comes later, much further down in the sheet, okay? Then these two boxes on the right, you will see excavation technique and you will see dimensions, okay? So we'll go through excavation technique first 
in almost all research digs and on most archaeological digs, things will be hand dug. But it is possible that things can be machine dug, certainly in consultancy. Um, the topsoil is invariably taken off a machine. You may have a concrete pad to break through first before you get to the archaeology that you still want to record. So that might be machine dug. So it is possible that machines will be brought in to assist. The weather conditions were asked sometimes why we even capture this. But if you have taken up um, Re re excavated and extracted archaeological artifacts and artifacts, ecofacts in massively heavy rain, they could be saturated. It might be good to know when someone looks at the sheet, I should go back and look at those bags and dry it, make sure all those materials are dry. And um, so it is, it is a useful category to still capture. The percentage excavated, have you excavated all the feature? And if not, estimate the amount that you've excavated and the tools used. Frequently this might be all the tools, but what we mean by that, did you use trowels, mattocks, shovels, um, leaf trowels, brushes, what tools were used to excavate the feature. And then you will see four categories again where you have to tick a box. Was it excavated by test trench, which is a large linear pattern, um, well a very long trench put into the ground to assess archaeology, frequently but not always used on road jobs in Ireland. Again, I'll pop up a photograph so you can see what that looks like. Was it excavated by sondage, which is a little investigative pit um, within the feature? Was it excavated by section, where you took slices down into it? Or was it excavated by plan, where you came systematically down from top down? Okay. Then you get to dimensions, length, width and depth, which I hope are fairly self-explanatory. You'll see in each of those though, it, it says was the feature fully exposed or not, okay? If you are dealing with a distinct cutting or trench and you've excavated 100% of the feature, um, or sorry, you've exposed 100% of the length of that feature within the cutting, I would frequently write in there, yes, within cutting four, i.e. the full extent of the, the feature was exposed in cutting four, but you mightn't have the full length of the feature overall, okay? On depth, you will also see there's a minimum and maximum depth because obviously fills, features can change massively in shape that might be this deep in one spot and that deep in another. So it allows you to give an idea that the feature is changing, changing shape. Then you'll see a coordinate from the center of the feature. We're going to be talking about how to plan and how to capture grid coordinates in a different video. Um, but it's basically asking you for an east and northern or an X and Y of the central point of that feature. This is not in any way to replicate your plan, it's just whoever, to give whoever is looking at the sheet a rough indication of where that feature is. So if you capture 10 post holes that are part of a house and they're trying to figure out which one you're talking about, they can look at the grid coordinate and go, oh yeah, it's feature number 2026 or whatever the, the number might be, okay? So that's all your top information. And now we'll move on to inclusions. One thing with inclusions is that it is only an inclusion if it's less than 10% of the whole. I know this might sound slightly confusing. If it's more than 10% of the whole, if you think it's more than 10%, then it becomes a defining characteristic of the fill. So it goes back to point number four on your description. So for argument's sake, if you think you're excavating a fill and the stone within it is more than 10%, then it becomes a stony clay or a stony sand. If it's less than 10%, it would be a sand with stone inclusions, okay? I know that sounds pedantic, but it's important in the, in the greater scheme of things. After that, it actually gets quite simple. So on our sheet, we have listed all the frequent inclusions that you get, like sand, pebbles, um, charcoal, brick, etc., mortar and you literally just tick frequent, moderate, or occasional, assuming that it's under 10% of the whole. If there's no inclusions, always tick the no inclusions box, so we know that you haven't forgotten it, that the, the soil did contain no inclusions. And then if, there's, if it's an inclusion that we haven't listed, or you have comments, there's a place to put that in, okay? Equally, you will see the next box, which is type of fines. Um, at the top, there's a, is it prehistoric, is it medieval or is it modern? And then all the frequent finds are then again listed. Clay pipe, post-medieval, medieval pottery, iron, bronze, copper, etc. And you tick the boxes to say what they are. This will correspond back to a bagged finds register. We have registers for everything in, in archeology. span A quick image of that will probably pop up. And I'll give you a very quick example of what's in that. So on the bag finds register, you literally, it's just a sequential list of all the bags of finds you have on site. So there'll be a bag number, again, given out in blocks of hundreds or thousands. 
um, a feature number, which will come back to the feature number on your sheet, what material the finds are made of, what period you think you are, there, they are, how many finds are in the bag, the coordinates and the meters above sea level for those finds, if you want to capture that in the date and initials, okay? So basically this list articulates the two different record types articulate with each other. We will be talking about the bag finds register in more detail in a different video, so we won't labor on it now. Interpretation. This is, I guess, where things get um, a bit more interesting. So there are prompts put here. The point of the interpretation is to say what the feature was for. It's definitely not to repeat the description that you gave in the top box. So for that reason, do not start talking about shape and orientation and color and composition again. You're more to talk about why is it there, what it was used for, um, has it been disturbed, why did people make this thing? Why did they place it in that particular place? So if it's a fill, you'll see we're asking, is it primary, secondary, or tertiary? And if you think of that in education, is it primary? Is it the first fill within a cut? Is it the second fill, or is it the tertiary, the final or ceiling fill, okay? Um, of course, you could have an awful lot more than three fills. So you could have one primary, one tertiary, and 15 secondary or more within the middle. Was it naturally accumulated, or was it just dumped there? Um, is it associated with a specific activity? And is it part of a group of features? So this isn't a wall sheet, but if you were describing a wall, you'd want to describe how many walls they are, how they join together, what sort of structure they make, what did you think the structure was constructed for? An awful lot of detail will go on that. And for that reason, you will see there's a PTO box there that you can flip over and you can put additional information in the PTO on the back, okay? But you're to try and capture what the feature is used for. If it was a, a post hole, how many posts were there? What orientation were they in? Did they join together? Did they form a clear structural pattern? What date do you think the other posts are? You're just trying to get to the essence of what this feature is about, okay? To the right of that, you'll see a small box that says archeological period. And effectively, these are all our main periods of prehistory and history, and you tick which is most applicable. If you're in doubt, you can tick a couple and put a question mark beside, and you'll see there's a very broad bracket there, four from bottom called medieval, 400 to 1540, which is the one obviously we most commonly use on this site, um, or high medieval, 1100 to 1300 for this specific excavation of Ferry Carrig. But tick whichever box is most appropriate. Um, because this is a student dig, we have checked interpretation, but we would have that for pretty much every site anyway, where your supervisor will come in and agree or disagree with the comments you've made, and then do also tick the PTO to put more details on the back. Um, with our normal field school when we're excavating out in the field, obviously students frequently think they know everything about the feature and don't realize that an awful lot of other information was captured in previous seasons or other parts of that season. So they put an interpretation based on what they know, but it isn't always the final interpretation. And that of course can happen on any site. People are always coming and going. Okay, the next big box, Record details. Let's take a, a little sup before we go on to that. Normally we don't ask students to fill out this box and there's a good reason for that because as I just mentioned, they're coming and going off the site the whole time and they might think they know every artifact, every plan, every photo that came from that feature, but they simply don't, okay? Everything we take on a site goes into a register be it the bag finds register, the sample register, um, the digital photograph register, the plan register. So we have all these details captured. The best time to fill out this box is when the excavation is finished and you can enter your feature number that you began with into the database and spit back everything that is associated with that feature. How many plans, how many section drawings, how many photographs, how many bagged finds, and how many Ecofax are samples and of which type and you try and capture as much, of pos as much as is humanly possible of everything that is associated with that, that feature on this physical sheet, okay? The next thing, which is probably the most confusing for students, is the matrix. So again, we have an example of a matrix here, which will pop up to the right of me. But the matrix is to capture the order of events. So your feature number goes in the bold box in the middle, this one here. And then what came before it goes underneath it, and what came after it goes on top. So if we run through the matrix that's popped up on your screen, you will, what you're basically looking at is an undisturbed subsoil. So in this context, 
they have decided to give natural a number and they've just given it simply 10. On most archaeological sites, all these numbers would have a preceding number. So if it was in cutting 1, it'd be 110 or 108 or 106, etc. And this subsoil has been cut by a series of intercutting pits, after which a topsoil layer 1 has accumulated over the whole top of them. So if you run from the top upwards, you can see the subsoil existed. That would be the bottom number. A large pit was cut through it, which is number 9. That then had a series of fills in order of deposition, 8 being the earliest, then 7, then 6. Then 6 was cut by another pit, which was 5, which contained the fill 4. And 3, sorry, which is cut by pit number 3, which contained the fill 2, and then a topsoil accumulated over it. Take your time, look at that, okay? And pause the video, have a good look at the image, and make sure you understand the ordering of this. It's much harder to do when, the, obviously, the numbers aren't filled in for you. The important thing of the matrix is to capture every feature number relative to two others. And if you do that over the site over time, all the feature numbers will create a chronology or a matrix so you can understand them all relative to each other. These will obviously be inputted into a computer program that will check all your chronology is correct and right. The most common being obviously the Harris matrix, okay? You will also notice on this that there's an equals box. And that's quite simple. If I am excavating a ditch fill over here and Alan in the corner um, is excavating another ditch fill over there, we think they're entirely unrelated features and we're digging away for a couple of weeks and then we actually join in. We've given out two numbers to the same feature. Okay, we didn't realize, um, but we have, and therefore we equal them against each other. So I'm digging 202, Alan's digging 426. They end up being one and the same thing as the site joins together over time. All right, so that's the, the reasoning behind that. Then at the bottom, you'll see there's a supervisor checkbox to make sure the supervisor has checked your sheet and they're happy with it, and date and comments. Okay, we'll flip over. Now, the back is quite simple in that um, it's really just to capture a sketch drawing of the feature you were talking about. This is not to replicate the archaeological plans or surveys that we do that we'll talk about in an extra video, but it's to capture the essence of the feature in one place. So you have the narrative description on the front and you have a drawn description of it on the back. The important thing is that this is to give you an idea of what the feature is and how it oper operated spatially relative to other features. It's not to be as accurate or as careful a representation of it as the physical archaeological drawing that you'll do elsewhere, okay? So an example, for instance, of a plan drawing is here, where there's been a wall deposit here, some of the other feature numbers labeled around it, the edge of excavation shown, okay? An omission on this is that there's no grid pegs. There should always be a couple of grid pegs, okay? So that's been left out of it. So that's a good example of something that's been done well and something that's been done poorly. That, of course, is a bird's eye view. Um, this would be a, a section view. So you can see all the major elements relative to each other, and there have been grid points and levels included on this, all right? So it's quite well drawn. So this is for feature number 1032. And you can see where 1032 is here, but you can see all the major features that were rounded spatially and how they interacted with each other, okay? So it's, a, it's meant to be more than a sketch. It's meant to be drawn approximately to scale, or at least as close to scale as it can be, but not a very carefully delivered scale drawing. For that reason, you will see there's a to scale and not a not to scale box, and you will see that there's a key, all right? So when we get to our drawing video, our survey and drawing video, we will talk about how keys are used and what drawing conventions we use. But any, um, any symbol that you use or annotation that you use, you explain in here. There's an area to indicate where north is, and there's also an area to capture meters above sea level. So you might want to put a level or two um, um, on, with on your sketch drawing, and this is how that's captured. But again, the detail of this will be discussed in your levels video, okay? How you take levels, why we have TBM, which means temporary benchmark, backsite, instrument height, and levels and reduced levels, what that means, okay? So those are the major elements of conducting a fill sheet, all right? As I said, there's only four or five types. There's a fill, well, four types. There's a fill, there's a cut sheet, there's a wall sheet, and there's a burial sheet. By far, the most common are fill sheets, okay? Um, cut sheets, less frequent, although 
certainly probably the second most common sheet used on a, an archaeological site. And what I'm going to do for the cut sheet, which hopefully is appearing beside me as we speak, is I'm going to go through the elements that are different in some detail and literally run through um, the elements that are the same. So the top box on the cut sheet is identical to the fill sheet. Again, it contains a feature number, supervisor, excavation number, address, etc. The two on the top right along the sidebar, excavation technique and dimensions, are again identical. Nothing new to add there. The archaeological period is identical. The checked interpreta interpretation is identical. The record details on the bottom left are identical. And the matrix is identical and done for the same reasons. Okay, we'll flip over quickly. You will see the sketch drawing, identical as well, as is the to scale, not to scale, the key, the north arrow and the levels, and the additional info um, is identical as well. You'll see in the, in the cut descriptions, the picto pictogram, um, or the information drawing there, is quite different to what's on the fill sheet. And there's a good reason for that, because it's asking for different information. So we'll flip back over to the, fr to the front and we'll go through those different fields. So you'll see in the description, there's five bits of information asked for again, but they're quite different to what was on the fill sheet. They're asking you to describe the shape of the cut. So the shape of, if you think of a cut as a cavity, so it's the shape of a physical ditch or of a pit or of a, a post, something that has been cut, dug into the ground, okay? So the shape and section, when you look at it at the side, is it U-shaped or what sort of shape is it? U is obviously the most common, but if you think of a ditch, what shape is it in section, okay? The break of slope at top, the profile of the side, the break of slope of the base and the profile of the base are all explained on the back of the sheet. So are the sides vertical? Are they sloping? Are they concave? Okay, concave being that sort of a shape there. Is the base, is it straight, straight across or is it concave? It is possible to have a convex base, but it's extremely rare. And the breaks and slope at the top, are, are they sharp or are they more gradual? Are they, are they very, very gentle? In which case we'd probably say, say non-perceptible or imperceptible. So on the front, you'll see the, the, the five fields. So the shape and sec section could be U-shaped. The break of slope at the top could be gradual for argument's sake. Profile of the side, straight. Break of slope at the base, gradual. And profile of the base for argument's sake, concave. It isn't always that the cut is a standard shape, so sometimes you may have to vary this description in the sense that you say the break of slope at the top is gradual on the north side of the cut, but sharp on the south side. It's not like they're always going to take a regularly shaped cut just for your convenience in, in giving the description. All right, so have a look through those and see if you can figure out how to fill them out. Um, then on the cut type, you have pit, ditch, foss, slot trench, drain cut, well cut, foundation cut, post hole cut, grave cut, and ritual. These will cover almost all the cut types that you will encounter on an archeological site, but there is an other section in case we've missed something. Um, for the purposes of today, we're talking mainly about grave cuts, so obviously you would tick the grave cut box, okay? The feature cuts, they're basically asking, what is the feature cut through? So, on any site, well, on almost every site, the feature will be cut through the original topsoil that was there on the site at that time. So that topsoil hopefully has been identified and given a number, but they could also be intercutting. You could have one grave cut this way with another grave cut across it that way, and which cuts which, okay? So what is the feature dug through? And then feature cut by, what is dug through the feature? So again, you're establishing the, the different chronologies of, of layers how things were dug into the ground, how they operate relative to each other. The fills, what was placed back into the cut. So again, if you imagine the water as being the fill, um, the bottle is the cut. So the cut was given the number for argument's sake, 302, and the fill is 301, you would write in 301 there. But if you excavated a large ditch on an archaeological site, it could have 100 fills, and you'll list off as many of those numbers as you can, okay? That's an important, I suppose, point to make, because cuts are a rarer sheet on archaeological sites, and they frequently can describe quite large features, or certainly quite important features. So you tend to put more detail on the cut sheet. So if we were describing the ditch of our castle up on the hill in Ferry Carrick, the cut is only one feature, 
but it could contain hundreds of fills that give you so much information about the site through time. As I was sort of saying, with the cut sheet, you tend to put more detail on it because it tends to be a quite significant feature or certainly a, a, a number that brings together a group of features. To give an example of what I'm saying, the ditch we have around our castle on Ferry Carrick might be a single cut, but it might contain hundreds of fills that give a good indication of how people lived across the site over time. And for that reason, we tend to put quite a lot into our, of description into our cut sheet. It tends to be the, the primary number by which we discuss sets of features or important features on site. So for example, if I was to discuss a, a grave cut on this sheet, I would be describing the individual or interpreting the individual grave cut but I'd also be saying how many other graves there were, what orientation they were, how they were laid out relative to each other, were there spaces in between them, were they in rows, were there gaps, why was the cemetery placed where it was. So a lot of interpretation tends to go on the cut sheet, so you tend to take a bit more time on it. On that as well, you tend to take a little bit more time in doing your drawing. So yes, it's still a sketch, like I was saying with the fill sheet. Yes, it does not replace the, um, the archaeological drawing that we'll talk about in other videos, but just a little bit more time, a little bit more care, and a little bit more detail on it. You will find in CRM or consultancy jobs that sometimes you're very, very tight for time. So people might just reference a drawing number, C drawing number 2001. So that's obviously a, the first drawing from cutting two, or C drawing number 6026, 26 drawing from cutting six, because they don't have time to replicate a drawing here. And they're directing you back to the main archeological drawing like everything, that can be a pain for people looking, coming to look back at the feature sheets and they have to go to a different source to get the full information to bring it together. So if you have time, always fill that out and certainly with the cut sheets, do your very best to fill out either a plan and our profile drawing on it. The last thing I'll say about the cut sheets is because they're so important, on occasion, you may need to go to an additional information sheet. So there mightn't be enough space for your interpretation here and here, and you've got to append another sheet to it, okay? Always mark one of two and two of two on the sheets. So if they become separated from each other, that you know that there's another sheet of information to be found. It's also just a point of order to say that we never join sheets together with anything like staples, sticky tape, etc., because they're not good for the site archive. Staples will degrade over time, they'll come apart anyway, and they'll stay in the sheets, and sticky tape falls off. There's loads of things we don't use in the site archive for those reasons, like what you would call whiteout, what we call tipex, because it'll fall off, and the correct information will fall off with it, and you'll be left with the incorrect information underneath. So if you make a mistake on these sheets, it's much better to cross them out and put the right logic, or the right, the correct interpretation underneath it, Equally, we have had students thinking they made a mistake and their first answer was right. And if they scribble that out too much or if they put white out over it, we've lost what the correct version of, of what they're trying to say. Um, we've lost it. Okay, so the last archaeological sheet, as I said, there are burial sheets as well, but we don't like to really defer to individuals as, as archaeology, obviously, um, is the wall sheet. Now again, they're very, very similar. Um, so just as we did with the cut sheet, we'll only talk through the sections that are different. The top bar is again the same, the one that contains the excavation number, the permit number, and the dimensions and excavation technique are identical. And the interpretation, albeit you'll say different things in it, but that the field looks the same, checked interpretation's the same. On the bottom, record details and matrix are the same, and the archeological period is the same. So if we flip over on the back, Everything that is done to record it in terms of sketching, levels, whether it's to scale or not to scale, putting in a north arrow is the same. But again, you'll see the pictures in the bottom right. Um, these have been taken again from the Museum of London standards, largely, not exclusively. Um, but you'll see it's quite different to the cut sheet and the fill sheet. And there's one for stone walls, the courses, and there's one for brick bonds, okay? So how to describe stone walls and how to describe brick walls. So we'll go back to the front and we'll look through the various different categories that you're asked to describe in a, in a stone wall, that, or a wall, um, stone or brick, that would be different. So your basic description, <coughs> excuse me, I'll just take a quick sip. Sip. <laughs> sip. Your basic description is to describe what the wall is, how it's put together, similarly as you would describe your fill or your cut, but we don't give five prompts here because you need a bit more flexibility in what you might be describing for a wall. The set fields, you'll see directly underneath that, 
are quite simple. So wall material, is it 100% made of brick? Is it 100% made of stone? Is it 100% made of concrete? Or what percentage of these um, materials is the wall made of? Frequently you may have a, a medieval wall that um, dates from 12, 1300s made of stone, but that's been altered with brick put into it in the Georgian period, and then maybe in the 20th century had concrete introduced to it as well. So the walls can be, can be formed of, of many different materials. If it is stone, what percentage of different types of stone and the major stones are put in here, not all of them. So what percentage is limestone, sandstone, granite, slate, etc. Most archaeologists in Ireland will be able to identify these basic stones. After that, you're getting into the territory of geology. So we don't have every stone category in here. If it's made by something unusual, it goes into the other category, okay? Um, a geologist might be able to inform you about what that stone is later on. Is it made from handmade brick or factory brick? And if so, which percentage of um, which brick, brick type? You'll see the stone wall construction. What way are the stones physically layered on top of each other? Okay. Um, and if you flip over, you will see the various different pictures of random coursing, squared, random, uneven courses, etc., etc. So there's visual prompts in describing how the stone wall has been put together. And that's exactly the same for the brick bonds. Is it English? Is it stretcher? Is it herringbone? How have the bricks been layered one atop of the other? Okay. Architectural detail. Is there any in the wall? Is there doorways? Is there um, windows? Is there tool marks? Is there mason's marks? If you don't know what mason's marks are, Google them. We won't have time to get through all that today. Are there coin stones? What sort of distinct features are there within the wall that, that show human agency or architecture? What bonding material has been used? If it's medieval, you would like to think it all be lime mortar or clay, but of course there could also be concrete introduced, there could be something else. What is that something else? We can send samples of bonding materials away to get them assessed to see how they've, I guess their composition, how they've been brought to get together. So has the bonding material been sampled? Has it been put into a bag and sent away to a lab for analysis, okay? How many courses are there? And this is where it gets slightly confusing. Um, so it asks for the total number of courses and then courses above foundation and below foundation. So medieval structures tended, as, as up on Ferry Carry, tended to be built on mass with, with little or no foundation where they'd make these huge walls, a meter plus in width, and they'd stay up purely based on the sheer size of them. In modern construction, we would always dig a foundation trench, build a foundation, put in a membrane and then start our various different layers up. So it's asking you for how many courses, how many layers are in the foundation, which could be multiple or could be none, and how many are in the above foundation area, okay, or the above foundation level. It's also asking, is there a foundation cut? Was there a trench dug that they physically put the wall into or is it just laid on the surface? Again, medieval buildings tend to be built on the natural geology. They're frequently not cut into the ground. Later buildings frequently have a foundation cut. Okay. What's the feature number of that cut? So we've talked about cut sheets. What's the number of the cut inserted there? And what fills were put into that cut? So you dig your foundation trench and put your foundation into it. You build your wall on top of it, but you had to push materials back into that trench as well. They then become fills. What are the numbers of those? And what types of fines have come from those fills, the bottom right of this section? Because obviously they'll give you an indication of date. Okay. Then the last two rows of the middle section are basically asking you the order again for events. I know this will be replicated in the matrix, but what wall sits on what? Okay, which is, which is it overlain by, which is it under, or are they bonded in together? Are they attached, okay? Um, so they're sort of the categories that, that vary on the wall sheet. Again, with the interpretation, a wall is a significant archeological feature, maybe part of a, a distinct structure. So your interpretation tends to be quite long. Okay, how do the walls join in together? What orientation were they? What sort of structure did it make? Were the foundations different for different walls? Because that indi could indicate phasing. Was the composition of the walls different from the east and the west or the north and the south? Because again, that could ind indicate al um, alterations or phasing through time. So you tend to put quite a large amount of interpretation into the wall section, okay? Now I know for the, for the majority of students watching this video, they will be thinking of it in terms of cut and fill sheets, okay, because it's a forensic anthropology program. Um, but it's worth mentioning the wall sheet, partly because it, it teaches you 
I guess the full collection of sheets, sheets, but more so you may be excavating a chapel. There could be wall tombs built into the chapel. It could be relevant to your, your archaeological recording. What you're hoping in terms of the totality of these sheets is that this information goes with the information that the osteoarchaeologist collects to form a coherent and full narrative. So we might record what artifacts went in with the burial, where they were placed, what sort of care was placed on putting that person into the ground. Were they thrown in? Were they tightly um, bonded or shrouded? How carefully were the rows laid out? All that will give you an indication of how the person was thought about when they were interned in the ground. Then when you look at the osteological evidence, you might be able to understand why was so much care given to this individual or why was less care given to another individual. You might find that the burials have some sort of pathologies or some sort of condition in life that might explain why they're given a different burial rite. You might figure out why the cemetery was laid out over different space um, were certain individuals put in one area, certain demographic, certain sex, um, as distinct from another area. So the two sets of, if you like, of, of empirical data, the data we collect in the field on these sheets, on our drawings, on our photographs, etc., go hand in hand with what the specialist comes back and tells us from the lab. So section one of, of these videos will focus on archaeological data and section two will focus on the forensic data, the the forensic anthropology data that we collect in the lab.